Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, and today we have on a super special guest, a guy who has worked on a tremendous number of hip-hop, R&B, and Latin records. He has uh, worked most notably in recent years with an artist named XXX Tentacion. You've probably seen that name written down, but have had trouble pronouncing it. So if you need to know, that's how you pronounce it. Mr. Cohen Heldens. Cohen Heldens, did I pronounce uh, Triple X's name right there? Correct. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Good. Uh, in addition to XXX Tentacion, he's worked with Timbaland, Dr. Dre, uh, Lil Wayne, Beyonce, Run DMC, Rihanna, J Lo. Dreezy, En Vogue, I said Timbaland already, Wiz Khalifa, a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of Latin artists as well, a notable one in that world being uh, Maluma. But Cohen has a really interesting approach. I think you can pick a lot from whether you're doing pop and hip hop and R&B or rock records, just because he has, I want to consider it a really organic approach where he really focuses on the things that are most important and doesn't always try to clean things up too much. And I want to talk to him about his philosophy here because a lot of this stuff really blew me away. Cohen, thanks so much for joining us. All right. Now, before we get right into the meat of things, I got to give a big shout out to our sponsors. Our sponsors this week being Sonarworks. Sonarworks make uh, this software correction system for both headphones and speakers and rooms where you can get much flatter frequency response out of both your speaker and room and your headphone situation. A lot of people rave about them. I know that Cohen himself is also a user of Sonarworks. That came out when I was talking to him beforehand. So big thanks to those guys. Also big thanks to Focusrite. I'm speaking through a lovely Focusrite Claret pre preamp once again, and also Sound Toys, making some of my favorite software effects in the known universe. Check out anything they make for free at soundtoys.com. With all that out of the way, Mr. Cohen Heldens, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again. Good Lord. stuff. So you've been doing this for a while. I think you started in music production, if I remember right, as like a teenager, right? Like 12, 13, 14, you were kind of studying music and getting into audio technology. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, it's completely correct. Yes. We're like kindred spirits here. I think I got my first cassette four track when I was 12. My dad bought it for himself and never figured how to use it. So it became my cassette four track and I've never looked back. And you grew up in the Netherlands where they kind of had, uh, you did some kind of extracurricular, you know, music theory learning and stuff like that. But you've worked on so many big hip hop records, but you didn't start out in hip hop, right? That's something that kind of evolved as things went along. Correct. Yeah. I started out doing production, like you already said, and the Netherlands kind of was coming up during that time with a lot of EDM productions. So kind of by organic ways, uh, that process became me producing EDM music. Um, and through that, I kind of started to develop more interest in the mixing aspect because the publisher I was signed to during that time told me every single time I send in a record, you'll mix sounds horrible, basically. <laughs> so I was like, how can I improve on, the, on those mixes? So I started trying to figure out, okay, is there uh, anything I can do as far as like in the weekends? Can I go to a local radio station and get, you know, either shadow somebody or get some time on the equipment and kind of figure out how things work and see how people work? Started doing that. And that evolved into um, more of the life aspect of uh, production. Mm. So I took a uh, kind of like a weekend uh, intern uh, job with a uh, live PA company in the Netherlands. The same owner had a recording studio. So automatically he's like, okay, I know your interest is more in the studio than it is in the live things of uh, entertainment. So he was like, you can shadow my engineer at the studio. And that's kind of how it started evolving into more the tech side of the uh, production aspect. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. A lot of that is uh, very resonant and familiar to me, a similar background here. I almost feel lucky I didn't have anyone to tell me that my mixes sounded terrible. I just had myself <laughs> to tell me my mixes sounded terrible in the beginning. But maybe, sir, the reason you're a more successful mixer than I was when I was mixing is that you had something to tell you your mixes were terrible. So that probably kicked your butt double into gear to make them good. So uh, that is, that's useful. You know, sometimes harsh criticism like will help you out in life for sure. It totally does. It's still now, whenever a mix is done and I hear it back, let's say a week or a month or a couple of months from now, 
I always start listening to them like, oh my God, that makes us terrible. <laughs> I could have done it so much better. I'm sure you got the same thing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, so many records I worked on early on, I remember particularly finishing them and immediately after finishing them being like, that's terrible. It doesn't live up to uh, any of my expectations. And it takes me sometimes years later to listen to things I did in the past and said, oh, actually, that wasn't that bad. I'm not that horrible. But I think part of it is, A, you keep on learning and getting better. So you criticize who you were yesterday. And another part of it, too, is that like you, you ha when you have your critical listening ears on, it's hard to take them off. Like you've been listening to these things through the lens of how can I make it better? How can I make it how better? How can I make it better? And it can be hard and take some distance to just say, all right, let me listen to this like music now. Like I'm without those ears that knew every single flaw in the recording and uh, can take a little bit of separation before you, um, you can hear it afresh, just like the artists and the audiences can. Yeah, like a consumer. And that's, that's indeed, I think it's always a, a balance, a struggle with that balance of, I got to listen as the consumer versus I got to listen as the quote unquote surgeon or the doctor that has to doctor it up and make it, you know, presentable to mm -hmm. that audience. Totally. Now, you also had a few big breaks. I mean, you've had mentors, uh, Timbaland, Dr. Dre, and Dave Pensato apparently was kind of one of your early virtual mentors before he was a virtual mentor to, to thousands. Uh, he was like a personal virtual mentor to you. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience getting to know Dave Pisato uh, early on? Yeah. So the way I met Dave was, I'd say, not traditional at all. Uh, it was during the time that I was trying to improve on my mixes and I started reading a lot of magazines. Mm -hmm. And one of the magazines I remember reading, I think one of the very first interviews that Dave ever did and at the end of the interview, he left his email address and he said, if, um, you know, if anybody has questions, something that he'd find interesting enough. And if he had the time for it, he would respond back. Mm -hmm. Of course, he didn't respond back to the very first email. So I think I wrote like at least like almost like, I don't know, like 20 or 40 emails to him <laughs> before one email came back. And it's kind of how I got in touch with him. And we kind of, you know, evolved with that relationship. And, uh, and especially in the beginning stages of my career, I was very fortunate enough to being able to have that mentor where I could write an email of like, hey, I'm struggling with this or struggling with that. And then he'll give me the perspective that was needed mm -hmm. to overcome so to speak, that quote unquote problem that I was dealing with in within the mix. Right, right. Now you're making me think in my earlier life, uh, I never got a virtual mentor like Dave Pensato. And it's possibly because I always thought I was being too annoying writing so many emails. I should have been more annoying. So that'll be a lesson to, to all of you out there, be more annoying. I'm terrified of saying that because I get a lot of emails as it is. So now people are going to write me 50 emails in a row if I don't get back immediately. So maybe I shouldn't have said that, but... Uh, no, no, it's funny that you say people it. People do like to help. I write back to so many of the emails I get, especially compared to YouTube comments I get. When people write emails directly, you know, when you have time, pe people do like to help. And, and like you said, with the persistency too, that's the way I'm at uh, XXX Tentacion. Oh, really? Because it, that. That, it was through that... that you know, that persistency. And I, I saw myself in that because in the beginning, uh, the way I got introduced to him was through a producer I was working with, a Jamaican producer. And we worked on the uh, reggae artist Sizzla mm -hmm. on his album. And uh, through connections within the Jamaican community, he knew of Triple X. So he would uh, hit me up and be like, hey, uh, I'm working with this on a kit. He's a SoundCloud rapper. Uh, he wants, you know, he wants some, uh, some songs mixed. And I told him about you and he's very excited to work with you. And I was like a SoundCloud rapper. I'm not interested in a SoundCloud rapper because mm -hmm. I try to evolve my career and I was focusing on what was already quote unquote big versus, you know, whatever new talent was out there. And he just kept pressing and pressing and pressing to the point that I was like, okay, play me the song you need to get mixed. Because I'm like, I, you know, I respect the persistency because I see myself in that. So I need to give you that chance. Like Otis gave me the chance to hear what you have. And that's when he played Jocelyn Flores. And that's how that whole relationship started. Because I was like, that's totally not what I expected from, you know, the, the basically the judging the book by its cover. Right. So that's, 
that's the persistency where I'm like, with people, please keep being persistent with everything you do. Right. That's so huge. I mean, if you can be persistent in, in music, music business, if you can be persistent without being a jerk, without being alienating, without uh, coming out with a sense of an entitlement or a chip on your shoulder when people don't get back to you immediately, but you can keep on staying positive and persistent. I mean, it's, it, it, is, it is big. Yeah. Yes. Correct. So what had you done at that point that made XXX Tentacion so interested in working it with you and, and coming at you so doggedly for so long? Um, I think it's it's more it was more about the producer that I was working with at the time. Because he had a lot of he respected him a lot and it was a lot of respect, uh, mutual respect between the two. Gotcha. Um but of course there was already some sort of a resume that was set that sat there from uh, working with, well, being managed by Timbaland's manager, Cheryl Banks, Big Rick, for a couple of years. Uh, not much came out of that because they were on the East Coast, of course. I was on the West Coast already. And it, it just works different if you're not being able or be able to be in a room with the people. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, especially, you know, how fast it goes with music creation. If it gets done, it's like, let's get this done the whole way through instead of, okay, uh, we need a mixer, let's, you know, figure out, oh, we have another mixer in another state or whatever. It's it's less convenient. Yeah. So from there, I kind of moved on. It's like, let's, I need to do something else with my career. Uh, rented a studio in Venice in Los Angeles, a suburb. And the same complex was a uh, producer that worked with Dr. Trey very closely, Dan Joins. And same thing, persistency. Figured out he was there, figured out which studio room he had, knocked on the door, he opened the door, and I straight up told him, hey, I mix. Uh, send me some records to mix. I'll do it for free. If you like it, let's build something. If you don't like it, no loss. Mm -hmm. Did some mixes for him. He loved them. Started working with him. And then automatically started working pretty much with, you know, the entire Drake camp to a degree. Did that for a good amount of time. Uh, we did one release that actually came out of that situation, which was the John Connor I'm Back record, which Drake's featured on. And I think I was working with them for we joined for about two or three years at that point and i said you know what i need to spread my wings and start being uh, independent again as a mixer and it was within the same month or a month after that uh one of my a and r buddies called me up with the sizzla project that's how sizzla came about that's how i met the producer and then through that producer uh triple x came along mm. Now, it's pretty impressive to get involved with both those camps, kind of rubbing elbows and being in uh, striking distance of Timbaland and then working you know, so closely with uh, Dr. Dre and some of his artists. Are there any lessons that you took away from those guys? And I should start at the beginning. Can you give me a big lesson you took away from Dave Pensado and a big lesson that you took away from either Timbaland or Dre in your approach today? So with Dave, the biggest... I'd say the biggest advice I got from Dave, um, and he's quoted that a lot too in interviews, is it's it's not always good. It's not always. Let me let me say say it right. I'm gonna paraphrase. All right. So don't judge me on this. He always says it's not about sounding good. It's about sounding fresh. Mm. So you still need to give the quality, but there's something about pushing the envelope of sound uh, in that aspect. Because if we think about it, if we all keep mixing the records the same way as they sound today, they're going to sound the same way tomorrow. And with that, it becomes very boring because everything will keep sounding the same. Mm -hmm. Versus you stepping out there and pushing the envelope and trying new things so that you get a new sound. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that he told me was, I can teach you what a good snare sound is. Uh, how to get a good snare sound, but I can't tell you what a good snare sound is. Because mm. at the end of the day, it's a tasting. Yeah. And then from Dre and Dre's camp, it has always been the feel, which before that I was very technical. Because I was like, I, everything needs to be good, everything needs to be improved. And then being under the presence of those guys, they're all about, there are no rules. It doesn't matter what you do. If I need to give 18 dB of gain on a frequency and it feels good, then that's what I'm going to do versus, you know, what anybody else would teach you is like, don't do that. That's way too much. It alters the sound, which it does. But at the end of the day, does it feel good? And that's how I started to become more about feel because at the end of the day, records are emotion. Mm. So we have to fulfill the emotion and the vision, artistic vision of the artist and the producer versus I need this to be, you know, clean. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's great, but... Sometimes you just take the feel away from the record versus 
enhancing the feel that's there so that people, you know, feel the emotion and, and feel relatability with the artist. And usually those records are also the records that, you know, chart the highest, sell, sell the most uh, units and just resonate a lot longer with the audience. Absolutely. And I think both of those words of wisdom you got from both uh, Pensado and Dre, they have something in common, which is that, yeah, a lot of big records sound kind of weird and they sound kind of different and they yep. they sound a little unexpected in certain ways. And here so many of us are trying to learn how to make things sound right and chasing the way people made things sound before. And to a degree, maybe you have to go through that process. You have Maybe if you want to be a well-rounded engineer, you have to go through that process of trying to copy other people's sounds or something like that. Um, and you, you have to know how to not mess things up in case the goal is to not mess it up. Yes. But you also have to learn how to how to go left and how to um, say, let's do things wrong because it's better. And yeah, it comes up so much. Right, which is the thing that happened when, when I was working with Triple X. Mm -hmm. After we did 17 album, I did uh, Jocelyn Flores, did, uh, excuse my language, F Love, I'll just call it, mm -hmm. featuring Trippy Red. Uh, he hit me up and was like, I'm doing a Ghetto Christmas Carol EP. I'm going to do it myself, going to release it myself, uh, doing it together with this producer, Ronnie J. Mm -hmm. And everything pretty much was done within a day. Production, recording, uh, mixing, mastering. And I remember trying to get a clean stem of one of the 808s in a Got a Christmas Carol E, the lead song, the title song. And I remember talking to Ronnie J and asked him, what DAW do you work in? He's like, I work in Logic. I'm like, okay, can you please, you know, check your levels and make sure that you're not sending me another clipped 808? Right. Then he's like, bro, that's the whole purpose. Mm -hmm. You got to look at it as it has to shake the trunk, but it needs to sound like the electric guitar, but mm -hmm. for hip hop. And I was like, wait, I'm trying to clean something up here. <laughs> Meanwhile, I need to go the completely opposite and figure out how can I make it sound even worse than it is, yes. which of course is what happened. But at the same time, in my head, I'm like, I'm going to sound like the worst mixer on the planet. Mm hmm. A hundred percent relate. Uh, absolutely. hundred percent. And it's, it's funny because you think about what is mixing, but basically the creative application of distortion. And I don't just mean that literally THD, total harmonic distortion, but whenever you compress something or even EQ something, you're making it sound less like the original. You are messing things up. Hopefully you're messing things up in aesthetically pleasing ways. And once you realize that you're doing that, even when you're trying to make things sound pretty, like if you're using an EQ to make something sound prettier, you're actually kind of distorting it compared to how it originally came in. And once you realize you're doing that no matter what, uh, that can be pretty freeing. I, I also want to piggyback on a little thing you said about the Dave Pensado thing about having, like, I can I can't tell you what a good snare sounds like, but once you know what a good snare sounds like, I can give you advice on how to get there. That's another thing that uh, took me a while, and I see in so many beginning mixers now, it's like they don't necessarily have this end vision of where should we go, where do we want to take this thing, and I think that's maybe like the biggest thing is knowing the right direction. Because once you know where you're supposed to end up, is it supposed to be dirtier? Is it supposed to be brighter? Is it supposed to be crunchier? Is it supposed to be thuddier? Once you know that, most people can kind of figure out how to get there eventually if they try enough things. But the yeah. knowing where to go, I mean, that's a big thing. And that's a big thing where us engineers really have to listen to producers and artists and to a degree take their lead and take inspiration from them. And it sounds like that's something that you learned to do early on enough to, to make a good run of it so far. Yeah, especially also when people say, are you mixing for the trees or are you mixing for the forest? Mm. Meaning don't solo out items and start focusing on, let's say, I just solo the kick and make the kick sound as the best possible kick on the planet. But as soon as you start, you know, putting other elements into that mix, all of a sudden now everything starts, you know, to fight with each other mm -hmm. because you made the kick maybe way too big or too present or whatever other instrument you had in solo that you made sound pretty. Yeah. So that's another thing. It's like, no, we need to have the overall context. Like you said, you need to have that vision for where do we go with this? And at the same time, in what context mm -hmm. are we doing this? Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. Questions, I w and it also must be more fun to work this way. That's the last thing I want to throw out there. Yes, <laughs> and it has to remain fun. As soon, it's another piece of advice Dave gave me years ago. As soon as it stops being fun, please quit. Right. And 
No, that is that is good. Now, speaking of fun, I'm curious, Triple X, XXX Tentacion, I hope I'm still saying it right and I haven't yes. started messing it up now. Okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, he seems like a really interesting guy. What was being in the studio with a personality like that like? Uh, do you have any memorable stories of working with him? Always super snappy. The thing that we liked was, or at least what he liked for me, is that I'm always very quick. Mm -hmm. So I always mix them within the first two to four hours. I have a first mixed version ready because mm -hmm. I go pure by intuition. And the funniest thing was he always expected me to do that. So he would call me up or he would, for instance, with Sat, I got the session and he's like, okay, send it back to me an hour. I'm like, I can't have a mix back an hour. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I'm just going to say yes and just work on it. <laughs> and I think I, the whole thing got done within four hours, but it was just this, this snappiness right. of like, Production is done, vocals are recorded. He might re-record vocals because he wasn't satisfied with the way his performance was for that day. Mm -hmm. But usually it was like, okay, as soon as the vocals were laid, there was no real real exact rough usually. And then he would send straight away the whole session to me and I would just mix the whole thing. And I think for certain artists that is beneficial because we know how we are as, as people, as humans. If we hear a version of the song and we live with that version for months, we get something that you know already, is, it's called demo-itis. Absolutely. So now every small little change that gets done to that record is going to sound too different. And it's going to sound nine out of ten times unpleasant because we're so used to hearing the record a certain way. And we can no longer distinguish the difference between is this an approved version from the record that we have or is this a, just a, a, a lesser version of the record. And I think it was a great approach to just keep things moving all along. Like, I don't need to hear a rough, no nothing. I like the way it sounded when I recorded it. I want to hear the mix back so I can start giving notes on the mix if there are any. Interesting. Now, I'm curious, that speedy process that you developed, when did you start getting that fast? Was it around the same time you kind of got that idea from the Dre camp about going more off of feel, or did you always try to be fast from the very beginning? It started before that when, you know, you start as the audio engineer recording people and then they're like, hey, can you send me a rough mix of what we just did? Yeah. And we all know rough mix have to be really quick. Yeah. But during that time, I was still trying to be sonically correct with all the technical terms you can give a song. And instead of doing it that surgically, the speed was still there, but now it changed because of the whole situation with Dre and Dre's producers like feel. So I started, okay, let's just go by intuition. So nowadays I just pull up the session and the first strokes that I do volume wise, panning wise, and then uh, little EQ things here and there are all based pure on intuition. Mm. And of course I have the riff mix with me because if I don't have a riff mix, I just won't mix your record. Because mm. I need to know what is your blueprint. I need to see your vision. Outside of creatively talking with the client, I need to know the vision as it is, the way you have it as the riff mix. And then I build from there because I don't like to, you know, reinvent the wheel that's already there and spend maybe eight hours getting to pretty much close to where you had your rough mix and then start building from there. Right. Just start with the rough mix and intuition, it's pure intuition. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I've, I've been there. And sometimes if you do end up reinventing things so they don't sound like the rough mix, the, the demoitis creeps back up again and you spend all this time getting <laughs> this drum sound. You're like, oh, this is the way it should go. And they're like, that's great. Uh, but why does it sound totally different than what we were going for? So yeah, it's it's good to know going in for sure. So how do you, do you use timers at all or anything like that to keep you on track and keep you going fast? Are you looking at the clock? Do you have milestones or the ways that you manage your time to consistently get things done? a certain period of time or do you have a consistent workflow you start with certain things and want to spend only so much time on it or are you not that precise and you're, you're thinking about the uh, the time and workflow not as far as time goes um, especially because I have a studio at home mm -hmm. so now we no longer have that that pressure that we used to have at the major studios we booked out 12 hours so I need to make something happen in 12 hours I think it's as good as it is bad at the same time because I like to have a time crunch, because a lot of times record labels call me up and be like, we have this record, it's a last minute mix, we need to get it back today. Right. It's like, okay, that's the pressure I like, but then I don't like the time, the clock of, the time clock, I need to say, mm. pressed on there for some weird reason. Meanwhile, I still have it because it needs to be delivered by the same day. Uh, but the way my process works is I always start off with the rhythm, because 
it's like a heartbeat. It's a rhythm. That's what we always gravitate to towards us as human beings. So the rhythm is first. If there are no drums, then there's usually another instrument that provides the rhythm. It might be a piano, a Rhodes, whatever it might be, or an acoustic guitar. But the rhythm is first, and from the rhythm on, I start uh, doing the vocals. Mm. Lead vocal, make sure that at all times, kick, snare, and vocal. That's mm. pretty much what I listen to throughout the whole time. And then everything else is more like either filling for the high end, the body, um, or just ear candy, if that makes sense. Yeah. But my main primary points are kick, snare, vocal. Well, that's how actual consumers probably listen, you know? So it's a, it's a good way to be. Now, I'm curious, uh, going back to, to Triple X uh, really quick for a second, the whole idea of a SoundCloud rapper and, and working with someone who is big on SoundCloud and kind of turning your nose up at first, has that changed your perspective on it? Do you work with more, more people who are like coming up big through social media or are you still going through kind of other nor more normal, more established channels as the primary thing and then that's ancillary? How do you look at and see that kind of dynamic now that you've had at least one success that was kind of underground, grassroots, you know, through social media big? It completely changed my view. Mm. And it's something that Tim Lund always used to say, instead of going with what's already popular and hot in the market, try to find the next talent, mm. the next big thing. Because then, you know, you establish a relationship with that artist and you keep growing with them. Mm. Versus you trying to get in with whoever is now popular, which nine out of 10 times, they came up the same way. They started out with their little click and built that whole camp out. Yeah. So nowadays I have, I look at and I talk to a lot of uh, youth because I'm like, I need to figure out what are the kids listening to. Yeah. And then you keep you keep kind of tabs on that, figuring out, okay, how are these artists evolving? And then at the same time, a lot of the record labels are giving me all the young talent that they're signing. Because mm -hmm. they're like, okay, we need something fresh. We need something that is somebody that's not set in their ways as far as mixing goes, where it's it's some sort of an ego thing of like, it has to sound like this versus, okay, let me talk to them and let's see what they're doing and build from that and keep pushing that envelope. Because mm -hmm. I'm totally okay with, using something or doing something on a record that completely goes against what I should, what I think should be right because mm -hmm. there's no right or wrong. So there's, it's a two-way process. It's the, the way of the artists that are coming up, keeping an eye on them, kind of seeing where that goes and finding the right moment to jump in there. Mm -hmm. And then it's the record labels that push a lot of the younger generational artists now my way. Yeah, so that actually reminds me of uh, watching the David Geffen biopic a while ago. I forget the name of it, but there was that uh, biopic on uh, David Geffen, the record label head. And I remember this part of his story about kind of, I always think of this when I think of chasing prestige. When he went out and started his own record label, he wanted to, you know, sign all of these big legacy artists that were, I don't know, it's like Tina Turner and like all these people who were big, like when he was coming up and he signed uh, all these big artists and he threw a ton of money at them and they all flopped and they made some of like their least successful records of their career because he was going after these names that had been famous and had been an influence on him. And when it was finally, when he realized, like, I need to get some kids in here who can go out and find the kids. I mean, that's when Geffen, which was one of the biggest forces in the record industry, when I was coming up, like, so many of the cool bands were signed to Geffen. It was because of that. It was because they were trying to find from the, the ground up kids looking for kids almost to a degree, younger people looking for what hasn't hit yet. And in my own career, I, I found that I've moved forward whenever I stopped chasing prestige and just trying to do what makes sense. And I think that uh, figuring out who people really care about without a big machine behind them, I mean, that kind of makes sense. Finding out who sounds fresh and interesting, who other people are talking about, who get numbers without a huge machine. I mean, that just makes sense. And it makes more sense than chasing prestige to a significant degree, I think. Totally. And I also think we might get stuck because I always look at it, I don't want to be 10 years from now and still sound the same as I sound today. Right. Because that's the way that was working at that present time. Yeah. I'm more like, okay, like you said, it's like, who's next? Who's, who's the next artist that's going to pop? 
mm-hmm. what are they doing? What are the kids listening to? Because at the end of the day, that's the biggest consumer market that we basically work for. Right. So it's it's like Geffen did, like you said, it's like have kids find the kids and then figure out, okay, which are the ones that I think are going to pop and start talking to them and start realizing their vision. And before you know it, they either are already on the radar of some labels or they're already signed or they're about to get signed and then you grow up with that next wave of very interesting influential artists. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And you're making me remember true fact about who actually listens to music out there, who's actually buying records, who's actually playing all the streams. And it's not so much dudes in their 30s and 40s. Like it is, number one, it's young people. And then number two, for actually buying records and spending re- money on music, a lot of it is women. A lot of it is younger yeah. girls. They, they, I mean, they buy more books than dudes do. They listen to more records. They buy more records. And it's sometimes you fall into this trap of if you have artists who are in their late 20s, or early 30s or whatever, they're trying to impress other artists. And it's like, that's not your end listener. That's not who's going to be excited about the next thing coming out. It is... I don't want to just say kids because they don't necessarily have to be teenagers. They can be in their 20s. They can be whatever. But it is about young people and young people who don't necessarily have a career ambition to be an artist themselves. And I think that's something that more and more artists have to keep in mind, that there's an audience outside other musicians, outside other producers and engineers who we're really making records for. And that gets lost, I think, maybe a little too often. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Yeah, good stuff. Now, a lot of stuff has happened in your career that you didn't expect. One of them I'm imagining is that you work on a lot of hip hop and R&B and Latin music. If I remember correctly, when you were a teenager, you were a classically trained pianist. You learned a lot of music theory. You learned the right way to EQ things and all that as well. <laughs> uh, so what were the first you know, hip hop opportunities that started coming up and how did you kind of really uh, you know, just find yourself in that niche, kind of moving forward in that niche rather than trying to pull in rock bands or what other other music you might have been raised on. Which is interesting because now I work on some rock bands too. Which oh, is, okay, it's, it's the weirdest thing. Yeah. So, which also came through Triple X because he always pushed the envelope for me too. Yeah. Because I remember just to, to hone that in a little bit when we worked on this album Skins. Uh, I remember he FaceTimed me up. He's like, I've got this new album that's almost finished. We're about to go on mix phase. Uh, I want you to jump on it. And I was like, okay, whatever you do, don't send me any of those alternative records. Mm-hmm. First record he told Sammy was One Minute featuring Kanye. Uh, yeah. which is, it's like a rock rock pop song. Yeah, I was like, cheese. But I understood what he was trying to do. He's like, I need to push you and he dev- you know, evolve your, uh, your trade as a mixer. So right now I'm working with um, Shavo, the bassist from System of a Down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He has a new band that uh, I'm mixing that entire project, which is quite interesting because it's the same way. They want to f- make more the bridge of, let's pull the rock world into the pop urban world to get it sounding fresh again or newer again, to push that envelope again. Um, so the way I got into hip hop to completely backtrack, I was still in Holland. There was a recording studio that just got opened up called Liquid Spillers in a city called Rotterdam, yeah. south of the Netherlands. Um, super ambitious project. They had the very first, or one of the very first 88R Neve consoles. Tonal outboard gear, their studio was designed by one of the premier acoustical design companies from, I think, the US. A lot of money spent. They thought that clients would just automatically come, big artists would come. <laughs> we all know that doesn't work like that, unfortunately. No. But the great thing was whenever US artists were having a concert or a tour in the Netherlands and they wanted to record, that would be the studio to record at because mm-hmm. that was the great marketing they did do. So at some point, I remember some people from Diddy's camp were there, uh, Jack Knight, Mario Winans, mm-hmm. uh, started working with them. So you start, you know, doing rough mixes as well and people start liking the rough mixes and it's a that's a very urban genre right there and from there you kind of start building that network because they're like hey i know this guy from the netherlands we're going to fly him out to the u.s um you know you should work with him we think he's talented and that's kind of how i got in that urban lane versus like you said chase, chasing the edm artist or the rock artist it, it started taking off in that genre right 
Now, does your kind of traditional, technical, classically trained background, you know, knowing music theory and all that, does it come in handy at all in the hip hop and the R&B world, which you don't necessarily think of as being harmonically dense? There's often, you know, lots of ear candy. There's often really focus on the vocal and on the rhythm. But is there still an application for any of those skills that you learned early on? Totally, especially when it comes to vocal tuning. Mm. So I'm not overly a big fan of auto-tune or other tuners like wave tune. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds very robotic, while a lot of times certain notes just are sound better in conjunction with, because it's still, to me, it's still a sound. People still now are so used to the auto-tune sound that it has become an instrument on its own. Yeah. But there are notes that are either too flat or too sharp that work better within autotune when they're manually tuned. Mm. So it's easily to pull up melodyne, for instance, and slightly move the notes or the pitch, pitch drifts to the correct position so that autotune won't overly react, but you still get the quote-unquote autotune feel of it. And at the same sometimes with 808s. 808s might be a few semitones all from the top kick that they layer in or from the sample. Sometimes they have a sample-driven loop in the production and the 808 is completely going out of tune with the sample because it's not in the right key. So you can easily move those up and make it sound like a cohesive record. So it does definitely come in handy, even with uh, certain genres that you would think might not need it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Since we're talking a little bit about uh, software tools and gear and starting again to that, this is a good chance for me to segue into some more nerdy conversation because we, we got to hit the nerd stuff, which is uh, when you are doing, well, do you still do any vocal tracking and recording these days or is it pretty much all mixing now? I've mixed, I haven't recorded in 14 years and I don't, I don't plan on doing it either. All right, fair <laughs> enough. So I won't ask you about any microphones. Um, I do want to ask you about what kind of systems and workflow you like for mixing. I know that you recently got yourself more of a remote rig, so you're able to do stuff kind of on the road in the box and you're getting good results with that. But can you tell me a little bit about what some of your must-haves are in the studio? Uh, what have been your, some of your favorite studios to work in? And what's your you know usual essential toolkit like for mixing a record? Uh, essentially, really is... Uh, the sponsor of this episode, I need Sonarworks. <laughs> All right. For the simple reason that I need to have a system that I actually understand and know that what I'm hearing is the music and not the headphones, not the speaker itself. Mm -hmm. Of course, in a room, it's always, you got to figure out what the room is sounding like so you can kind of take the room out of the, the equation. But I'd love to take my own mobile setup with me if I have to go to a major studio. Mm. Uh, because it's it, everything on there is so custom made to what I need to have. And the one thing that I use the most is the Brainworks SSL channel strip. Mm. Which the one are you 4, using, 000? the E or the G? The 4000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The reason why I choose the 4000 still over the 9000, mm -hmm. which they just released. Yes, yes. Fortunate enough, I am most likely you have as well. I've worked on both consoles mm. during my career. So... When the J came up, it was amazing because it was so efficient. The computer was quick. You could do the automation and the recalls. You could do it much, much more efficient and much more quicker than you could do on the old 4000. Yeah. The beautiful other thing was it was a lot cleaner. Because mm -hmm. in Pro Tools, we were still not there where plugins had the algorithmic uh, capabilities and the CPU power or DSP power to run very high dense pro, uh, plugins like we can nowadays. Right. So we were trying to get to the clean, cleanest sound possible, which we nowadays know that digital doesn't sound good because our ears are just not used to clinically clean mm -hmm. sound. It needs, like you said before, distortion, any type of distortion to kind of sweeten it up. It's like seasoning when you're cooking. So the reason why I keep using the 4000 in the box is because you can drive the distortion and it gives you that nice distortion, mm -hmm. that nice third harmonic distortion that, for instance, the Neves don't have. The Neves have the even distortion, which is really nice for your bass and your kick drum. That's why I love to use 1073s or emulations of the 1073s still on my drums as line inputs, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then use the SSL 4000E brown knob EQ mm -hmm. from plug-in alliance on the drums and I love clipping drums because at the end of the day it's all about the transient information that's there yes. that makes our ears recognize what we're hearing. So if I do that with the 9000, it's I always say 
distortion on a 9000 to me personally sounds like a broken fan. Right, it's, it's either distorting and it's bad or it's clean. And that's it was designed to do that, to give you high exactly. headroom so you're not going to distort until like you're distorting. Yeah. Which was great for that era. Yeah. Which we now figured out when we're all in the box, that's not what we want to have. Right, because you're already cl as clean as can be. And the idea behind the 9000, I guess there are some people who are going to prefer the plug-in version because it's still going to be like, hey, if you want the SSL style EQ without adding any more distortion because you're getting that distortion from other sources, then that's a good argument for using the 9000J in the box. But if it's like, I want the distortion of an SSL, then the one that's going to give you more 4, SSL 000, distortion yep. is going to be the 4000. Yeah, a little grind. And the beautiful there, thing, there, too, there. with the plugins is remember when you had the large desk and you would go and load up, let's say, 72 channels or above, mm -hmm. it started to make a lot of noise. Right. Which is great for now in the box. Yeah. Because we, you know, I always turn the, the analog noise off because mm -hmm. I'm like, I still need the cleanliness, so to speak, of the sound. I don't need that, that extra noise with it. Mm -hmm. But that's a great thing compared with the console where now I don't have to size down on the buckets because it's starting yeah. to become too noisy. One thing, incidentally, I like about the Plug-in Alliance versions, they're not a sponsor on this episode, so I shouldn't be saying nice things about them. No, we say nice things about people <laughs> if we like them, no matter what. So uh, one of the things I like about them is that in addition to being able to turn off the noise or turn up the noise you know, as much as you want, you can turn up or down the, the total harmonic, like the saturation, like the, the there's the V gain and then the THD. And I like yep. that because usually from records from the past, it's not like they were just mixed on the console. It's like they were tracked through the console too. Like there's many stages of analog they would have gone through. So just using a console plugin on the way out could be enough saturation, but the idea that you can kind of inch up how much saturation, so it's a little bit more like going through multiple analog devices. I like that flexibility as well, which makes a lot of sense. I like to do that on vocals, because mm. a lot of times, as we know nowadays, vocals are tracked either directly through a preamp on an interface, mm -hmm. hardly, hardly any time is there anything in between. Sometimes it's still, people still do it, but it, like you said, it enables me to give an, you know, that extra little grit that sounds so good on vocals to make them pop more out of the mix by turning up that total harmonic distortion a slight bit. Yeah, good stuff. All right. So uh, some of the plugin alliance console channel strip plugins where you're starting with a lot of this stuff, having a monitor or speaker situation where you know what's going on, probably using sonar works to help tune your speakers in your room. Are you the kind of guy who mixes through multiple buses, like separate instrument buses and things like that? Or are you more just a master fader? What's, what's that kind of signal flow like inside the DAW for you? I like to group things. Mm -hmm. So I like to do multi-stage compression because it's, it makes it easier for your master bus to get compressed. Sure. So I have my drum group, which I compress, uh, but I also do transient design after that. The mm -hmm. reason why I do that is because, as you all know, compression kind of shaves it off. Mm -hmm. I like That's to fast, yeah. even the playing field on the rhythm section, then enhance what I want to enhance, split up in a multi-band uh, transient designer. Mm -hmm. And then I can run it through my master channel and pretty much abuse it. Because right. now I can hit it really hard and it's nice because the harder I hit it, of course, there's more distortion mm -hmm. that's coming from the compressor and the limiter. But it's gonna give me that nice overshoot uh, that I'm getting from the limiter and compression distortion-wise to make the drums even sound harder. Mm. Doesn't work for all styles of music, but primarily in the urban uh, sound, it works pretty well. And I do the same thing with bass. So bass will come out into a bass fader that I use as a group fader and I'll compress that too or I soft clip that depending on what kind of sound I want to get out of it. Same with the vocals, all the lead vocals get combed down to one main lead track, uh, ad libs, backing vocals, whatever it might be, and all of those end up on a main vocal fader again, a group fader that I put some compression on just to kind of even out the playing field on all the uh, individual elements and then all of those come out into a master. And on the master, I do some mid-side distortion because mm. I like to give it a little bit of width through second and third harmonic distortion. So mm. I use second harmonic distortion on the mid-channel because that maintains my bass and my bass and, and my low end sounds better 
with even harmonics than with odd harmonics. Mm -hmm. And I can now use the sides by giving it a bit more distortion with third harmonic distortion, the odd, mm. the odd distortion to widen it and make it flourish a bit more, give it a more colorful sound. All right. And then from there on, it, it, it goes into, um, I like the Shadow Hills Mastering Bus Compressor, the A, the Type A that Plugin Alliance just put out. Yeah. I still use the uh, UAD version, the green one for the drums. Mm -hmm. But on the mass, I have the, the A. Uh, with the A, the great thing is um, you can give it just a, a tiny bit of compression, just like maybe max half a dB. But because of the coloration you can give with the opto and the discrete, you can get an extra additional distortion tone to the overall mix. Mm, I love that idea. And uh, for I, I hope that most people by now know what we're talking about when you're saying the even order harmonic distortion versus odd. But you're saying, like you said earlier, even order harmonic distortion, a little smoother, a little rounder, more of a Neve-like harmonic distortion on the center channel where your bass and your kick and your vocal is living. And then that kind of harder, more aggressive, crunchier, odd harmonic distortion, the SSL kind on the, the side channels. I really like that idea. I'm going to have to steal some of these ideas from you because I do a lot of Go for MS it. processing and mastering, doing a lot of mastering these days, but I haven't thought about treating my sides and center separately for saturation until just now. So I'm going to, if this works for me, I'm going to be telling the whole world I learned it from Cohen Heldens. <laughs> so uh, thank you. It, it, it sounds obvious now that you're saying it. So uh, I'm definitely going to give it a shot. Very cool. But that's usually with everything, 2020 vision. Yes, yes, totally. Now, do you use any hardware in your process or are you pretty much all software these days? Everything is in the box. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it has to do with speed. It has to do with the session recall. Yeah. I know that many uh, Maraquin has developed a great system on the analog end mm -hmm. where he's really quick with running multiple sessions at once. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather stay in the box. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> it's just for me, it works, it works better. I don't want to lay things back out on the console or sum things down and then print the stems and then get it back out. Uh, especially nowadays, since Pro Tools has made uh, the commit function mm -hmm. in Pro Tools, so now I can commit actual channels yeah, or groups. So I already have like a, exactly, I have like a, a sum down version that we used to do back in the day on the console yeah. within the session. So whenever recalls come in, I can quickly pull up the Pro Tools session, do the change, print it, Go back to the session I was working on. Yeah. So everything is in the box. Well, Manny does amazing work, and he obviously has a system that really works and is efficient on an analog console. But my guess is if Manny was just starting out now, or if he was 20 years younger or whatever, he probably wouldn't have developed the, that system on the SSL because he would have just learned in the box and figured out how to make things great that way. But since he already had this knowledge and comfort on the console, it only makes sense to be like, Hey, this thing's here. <laughs> you know, I know totally. how to use it. <laughs> you know, I'm fast on it. Let me make this my process. So it, it makes a lot of sense for him, and he absolutely does great work on it. Yeah, it's like a Bentley in the park, in your, in your driveway. I have this Bentley, but I'm not going to yeah. use it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, and that's I, I, that's what happened to the SSLs in a lot of big studios when I was coming up in New York, is they w were just used for two channels coming out. And I know that Manny uses it for more than just two channels coming out. Yeah. So, uh, but I'm with you these days. I'm much more, even with just mastering. I used to master on an analog slash digital system. I have changed to just mastering on a all digital system. I can get to the same place because I know where I want to go. Like I have that envision in mind. It's just about how to get there. Do I have to do, do different things? Yes. Do I have to turn the knobs differently? Yes. Do I use slightly different tools? Yes. But the same vision is there and you just, you just get to it with a different set of tools. So I'm with you. And the recall, because everyone, especially younger artists, they expect it's it's a word processor. Can't we just go in and change paragraph two? You mm -hmm. know, yep. so that's that's the reality of the world we live in. So, question for you: yes. How do you try to keep recalls to a minimum, if possible, so that you're not going back and forth uh, so much? Because all these clients know you can just open up the word processor. How do you keep that from slowing down the process? I'm fortunate enough that most mixes I do either get a mix pass V1 approval mm -hmm. or a V2 or V3. Yeah. The only time it goes beyond that is because they want to try different arrangements. Mm -hmm. So it becomes more of a production thing again. Yeah. But other than that, it's it's I've been fortunate enough that they already had the record where it needed to be. Yeah. Uh, took it. I would say mixing is the the five percent that's still mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. on the record and just brought it home. Yeah. So there's not been really a situation where I had to be like, I'm a mix revision 20, what's going on? <laughs> I always say if I go beyond mix 
mix um, revision five, mm -hmm. then most likely I might not be the right mixer for the project because it right. seems like we're not on the same page. Like whatever I'm doing does not resonate with what you guys have as a vision. Yeah, that's been my experience too with mastering. I'm usually... I'd say a large majority of projects are getting no revisions and then a, a smaller number are getting one revision and then an increasingly small number are getting you know two revisions or something like that. But the biggest part that, that I've learned is exactly like you said, like getting on the same page with the same vision with the artist to begin with, listening to the same records that they love the sound of, you know, getting in tune with them. And once you've done that, you do that work up front so you don't have to do it later. And I think that's been, you know, it sounds like that's a key to your approach too. It sounds like you were asking when we were talking about Triple X, he was sending you, you know, other tracks for inspiration. And that is something that sometimes people forget to do is like care about what kind of records their clients care about, you know? And that's how you stay yeah. fresh too, right? Is to have younger people who you work with saying, Oh, here's this new great record you gotta check out. Have you heard of these guys? And you're like, Of course I have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tell me which song right. I should listen to though, you know? Right. And that's how I stay current is my clients. Like I ask them, like, what are your, what records are you love in the sound of? And that's how I, yeah, I hear new music is through my clients. And uh, if I didn't have that, I don't know how I'd stay fresh. Same here. That happens to me all the time. They're like, Hey, have you heard this artist? I really mess with this artist. Let me play the records. They're like, this is cool. Like I would have never found this artist because the only, the only other thing I do is Every single Friday, Friday morning, I open up Spotify mm -hmm. and I listen to the top 50 of Spotify and the new mm -hmm. releases and just kind of see what the streams are gravitating towards. But then at the same time, it's great. You can sound like them or you get the project where it's completely left field and you don't know what it is going to do, but it might become a super big project. So it's still like you said, OK, what kind of references are we setting against this? Because we all get inspiration from something that has already been done. Mm -hmm. Everybody that produces, everybody that writes, everything technically has already been done because part of it is the inspiration you've gotten from whatever you grew up listening to or whatever you're listening to nowadays. Yeah, that's a good point. And I also like that idea of maybe sometimes when there are people who really come out of left field and change things, they're thinking less about what do I want to sound like and more about what, what do I not want to sound like? What am I reacting against? And I think there's a little bit of that in some really cutting edge artists that they, they know who they don't want to be. And um, maybe that's sometimes where, where, where new flavors come from. That's what Triple X did. He distorted the whole master for Look At Me. Yeah. And I remember I hated that record. I didn't even know it was him. But I remember <laughs> an artist that I was working with kept playing that record. I'm like, this is totally trash. <laughs> and then you start, you, you know, you start understanding the artist. You, you know yeah. the artist. And then the artist starts explaining the process of the reasons why. Yeah. That it was done on purpose. And then you understand this makes sense. And it is completely left field, like you said. But... Mm -hmm it's pushing that envelope again of this is something fresh. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to sound good in order to sound, you know, to do great. Yeah. Well, I also think that social aspect of music is important because when we grew up, I mean, part of the music that we love is the sound of it and, and you know, the structure of it and all that. But part of music, and we're lying to ourselves if we don't admit to this, is there is a social cultural identity aspect to music. You kind of both find who you are and show who you are through the music that you love. And there's a good thing and a bad thing about that. And one of the bad things is that sometimes if you're listening for new music to like yourself, you can have your guard up, you know? Yeah. Like you have your like the shields are up and it's like, I don't know if I'm gonna like this, you know? But as soon as you're connected to another human being and you've developed a relationship with them and you have their best interests in mind and they have yours and you like each other, and then they come out with you with, with here's this thing I've been listening to and here's why I like it, all of a sudden you open up in a way that music by itself can't do. Like that social component of music is, is huge to transmitting music and, and getting people into new things. So that's, that's one of the reasons I love hearing new music through my clients and one of the reasons, like you said, you could hear Triple X before working with him and be like, who's this guy? But then you get to know him as a person and say, oh, this guy's cool. And then it's like, oh, his music's cool. Because now I hear what he's going for. And now I can listen into it for like the humanity. It's just easier to connect yep. once you've connected as people, right? Totally, totally. And again, music is feel, it's emotion. It has to be relatable to the audience that's listening to it. Yeah, yeah. Because what happens if we create music and nobody understands what it is about, what is it going to be like? 
That's something wrong with this. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. You know, music ultimately is communication, right? And we're yeah. communicating emotions to other people and uh, stuff like that. Provide healing and, and yeah. happiness and joy and sadness and anger. Yes, absolutely, man. Making people feel a little less alone in the world, right? Like uh, other people get it, you know? There's someone else yeah. out there who gets it and can turn it into this beautiful sculpture for you to walk into and, and experience, you know? All right, this is uh, all of this profound uh, emotional arty stuff is great, but tell me more about gear. Uh, this is what yes. we got we to do, right? <laughs> so um, I did ask you about uh, what you use. Channel strips are big for you, the SSL channel strips, Shadow Hills bus compressor you like on Master Bus. I'm curious for your other subgroups and buses, what are some of your other favorite compressors for buses? And are there any time based effects you've really been loving lately? Oh, that's a, that's a trick you want. Um, you I can have secrets whole, too. I know, I, but I keep my whole system very streamlined and simple. Yeah. Uh, depending on, like for instance, guitars now with electric guitars, I still use the, the SSL channel strip, the 4000, the E with the black knob. Uh, I use the, uh, the onboard compressor for that. Vocals always change because it depends how they recorded the vocals and how the vocalist is sounding on a rapper. If it's a rapper where it's it's very transient and... It peaks a little bit too much. I can soften it out with, with a tube emulated compressor, like, uh, you know, anything from a TLA 100A, which is a combination uh, of tube and, uh, and solid state, which always worked nicely for that. I love that. I had um, I own two hardware TLA 100As, oof. and they were one of those compressors where vocals and bass, the the needle could be like pinning, like a ton of yep. compression. And it's like, is the compressor on, you know? And like, it gives... It didn't feel like it was in a vacuum, and that's what I always didn't like or still don't like with compressors yeah that's why i always go switch between compressors and vocals because very quickly it starts sounding like it's stuck in a vacuum i'm like no mm -hmm. now it's just squeezed i need it needs to still breathe to a degree and it, yeah. it's like you said it's the, the tla 100 a just you can squeeze a whole vocal through it and be like i have it on bypass i think and i'm like oh no <laughs> right. it's still on yeah <laughs> so, is that another so plug in alliance one, one the tla 100 a soft tube soft tube that's right soft tube yes I believe that I, I own the plug-in version as well. Yeah, they got in on that one pretty early. Ah, good one. They also make a great emulation of the CLA 1A. Oh, from, yeah, uh, the 2-Tech. Tech. That's yeah. a great one. Uh, but Focus, it, it changes so much compression-wise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and then even EQ-wise, I usually use the Fat Filter EQ uh, Pro 3, mm -hmm. which would be the, f the first one on the actual group. So I would roll off some low end. I would shelve out some low mids mm -hmm. to kind of get that a little bit less muddy. And then because it's also a dynamic EQ, mm -hmm. I can just listen and be like, okay, that's too much 3K in, in, in the vocal, which is just too piercing when we listen back to a record. It's going to annoy us. I can easily just pretty much notch it out with a dynamic EQ to soften it. Uh, and then after that, I do some compression, which could be any, like I said, any type of compressor. Um, I have one on the way with uh, Black Rooster Audio, which is oh. the KH Comp 1, mm -hmm. which... Say the model name again, KH what now? KH Comp 1. So this is going to be KH for Cohen Heldens, like this is your compressor yes. that's coming out. Yes. Oh, all right, tell me about this. So what we what we did is we, um, instead of just peaking RMS detection, we also have the Hurlbert Transform. Mm. I'm not familiar if, you, if you're familiar with a Hurlbert Transform. I'm not, you're going to have to hit me to this. It uses phase, it uses uh, phase cancellation. Okay. So it analyzes in the positive phase of a, of a signal and kind of cancels out the negative mm -hmm. phase of a signal and then it uses phase inversion. So the 90 degree phase shift and builds an envelope through that based on the signal you put in. So if you put in a sine wave, the, the transform envelope will look like a sine wave, so to speak. Mm. But by doing that, you enable a true zero attack time. Huh. Yeah. So literally, it can compress immediate, which is extremely useful for kicking, bass, and kick. Mm -hmm. Ducking, uh, kick, and bass, I need to say. Or any other like sidechain type operation, like DSing. Um, like I said, even maybe removing harsh frequencies or debooming something. Real easy for that. But the compressor also is very, it's very, it's, it's a clean compressor, mm -hmm. which it's weird for vocals sometimes. I like to add some color, but usually I like to add color with 
uh, with an equalizer versus a compressor, because like you said, it's what we spoke before, it's the squeezing sound that I'm not a fan of. So this is a very transparent, but a very effective one, because I can do the same thing as with the TLA 100A. Mm. I've tried it and completely nuked the vocal where the needle is almost completely down. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that happens is it slightly moves the, the bit frequencies a little bit up, so the presence of the vocal becomes better. Uh, more apparent, but there's not really any of that that vacuum squeezing going on. Um, so it, it'll come out, um, I think, probably next month. Oh, all right. Um, Where should we look or follow along to get announcements for this? Um, either on my, I will post it on my Instagram, but I know that a few outlets are going to do some reviews for it once we have a very solid beta. Because I'm still working with a beta, but we're making sure that every, of course, in every DAW, every format, it's stable enough. Not that we send it out to somebody to review and they open it up and the whole system crashes. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. What is this? Well, it's the crash plugin. All right. So give uh, me this again, Cliff Notes, because this is new to me. Tell me the type of compression this is again. What was the, it started with a H or something? Hilbert. Hilbert. The Hilbert Transform. Can you spell that for me, Hilbert Transform. H-I-L-B-E-R-T. All right. Hilbert Transform. And it's using phase in order to shape the envelope of the compressor. Now, one quick thing here. Um, there are some compressors that can do zero attack time through kind of look-ahead function, right? Would the idea behind this be maybe that it would require less latency or processing power to get you the same zero attack time? Or what's the, the benefit there? Yes, and there's approaches? zero. There's also zero overshoot. Because mm. with look-ahead, it's still... Although it enables you to get fairly close to a zero attack time, mm -hmm. the uh, once the compressing part, compressor part kicks in, it still gives you a little bit of a overshoot. Mm -hmm. With the Hilbert, it won't allow because it's immediately a zero attack time. There's no look ahead. Mm. So that's the difference, which again is real useful for side chaining uh, and ducking elements. Interesting. And this compressor is going to be called the KH3, was it? KH Comp 1. KH Comp 1. Okay, KH Comp 1. Cohen Heldens Comp 1. All right. And uh, is this going to be a multi band compressor or single band? Single band. Single band. But you can do all sorts of funky things to uh, get side chaining other things and, and all that. So I'm sure you can tailor uh, how it responds on the way in. So, yeah, you can do, you know, you need, you can go from hard to soft knee anywhere in between. Yeah. Of course, there's a dry wet switch in there. Mm -hmm. There's uh, sidechain filters, of course. Good, good. So you can sidechain filter the high end or the low end to make sure the compressor doesn't overreact either to, you know, very bright, hard asses or, you know, the occasional step on the microphone st uh, stand that an artist might do. Well, I'm psyched to check it out. I'll have to try. Are you going to give a free demo period or anything that people can check out when it comes out? Yes. All right. Sweet. So follow Mr. Cohen Heldens on Instagram. It's the best place to follow you. Where are the best places to yes. find out more about Just you? Instagram. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have a particular handle there? Or people just type in Cohen Heldens and there aren't too many Cohen Heldens out there? Mixed by Cohen Heldens. Mixed by Cohen show. Heldens. And that's K-O-E-N. Cohen. Cohen Heldens. K-O-E-N. So definitely check him out. Cohen Heldens, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. We got to check out this KH Comp 1 when it comes out. Excited to hear about. Big shout out to our sponsors. Once again, we're Sonarworks. Mr. Cohen Heldens, a user. He seems to swear by the stuff. Is there any Sonarworks correction going on in those headphones right now as we're speaking? Yes. <laughs> right. Yes, the vocals are corrected right, <laughs> right now by stuff. reference four. <laughs> Good stuff. Also, uh, Focusrite, I'm speaking to a lovely Focusrite interface uh, right now. They make amazing bang for the buck stuff, all the way from the low end Scarlett line, one of the most popular interfaces ever made in the history of the interfaces and really high-end stuff all the way up to the red series also sound toys makers of some of my favorite sound mangling effects have you ever used any sound toys plugins always decapitator is on a lot of stuff 808s yeah. vocals their delays the echo boys mm -hmm. great creative stuff like filter freak yeah you name it i love them as a guy who likes distorting stuff and messing it up, you, you got to check out Sound Toys. Uh, you can try out anything they make for free at soundtoys.com. Just get the whole bundle. Like, it's not that expensive. And then you have everything they make. It's insane. Or you can get little inexpensive ones that are uh, super fun to have. I think that's about it. Um, Cohen, any famous last words before we uh, let you go for the day? No, just stay creative. All right. I love it. Those, those are good last words. All right. Thank you, Cohen Heldens, for hanging out with us. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time.